All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, in this section, we're going to look at the actual painting process for our prop. And this is the end result here of the design phase of our work, where I've gotten all my ideas down, and I've decided on something, and I've solidified to this design here. And it's broken up a little bit strangely, but I can explain all of this. So this part here is the highest detail bit of my weapon. So I've just gone ahead and drawn that larger and slightly separate from the primary weapon itself. And we can see the primary weapon drawing down there on the bottom. Um, this document is 3,000 pixels by 3,000 at 300 dpi. So it's about uh, 10 inches, if the math is correct there, which is plenty big. Um, you typically want to paint as large as you can manage on your computer so that you can always size down. Um, as long as it's not lagging your computer or making the painting process uncomfortable, then just go nice and big, however you prefer. Um, so I've got my <clears throat> template to work from for my drawing as well as for the blade down here and I've got my references on a separate uh, layer back here and just really briefly let me explain the layer stack uh, my background layer I almost always go with something neutral like a gray to paint on top of because if you're painting on top of white everything you paint looks darker if you paint on black everything you paint looks lighter and so I prefer something gray um, this was most of my original document where I had my references. You can even see some of the text still in there where I'm going to have this visible intermittently so that I can uh, color sample from it or refer to it and uh, get an idea of what it is exactly I'm painting. So I've got like my wrapping, uh, engraving, blade and metal sort of patterns as well as some, I think it's brass, uh, it could be bronze, but either way. And then this one separate, I've got my drawing layer, uh, my specific drawing layer which is on a layer with transparency and if you can afford to do this like if you've drawn on layers with nothing else on them it's great to have your drawing on a transparent layer because it means that you could paint underneath it and turn your layer um, really transparent so i'm just going to for instance make a new layer underneath i've got a red color selected right now and so if i paint just some shape down in here then we can see the drawing up on top there. And if I wanted to see it more distinctly, I could turn this up or turn it down. Or eventually the goal is pretty much just to turn it off entirely. I also prefer the gray because having that checkerboard in the background is really, really obnoxious. And so having this gray background layer means that I can paint comfortably, whoops. But at the end of my entire process, I could turn this off again and have a nice separate uh, subject that I could transplant onto any background that I want to. So I'm going to go ahead and just turn everything back on. So this layer right here, I've also labeled some of them. Um, this one I should label, yeah, drawing's fine. This one could be my um, paint or primary paint layer reference and background, just to keep everything straight. So the very first step I want to do here, and I'm going to start with this handle because it's more complicated, is to at least fill in the entire figure solidly so that I can lock the pixels and not worry about my paint going outside anymore. So to that end, I'm just going to quickly work all over this figure, um, just giving it nice silhouettes. The brush that I've selected here, and this is going to be unique to whatever program that you use, is just a, a hard edge transparency brush. So if I press softly, I get semi-opaque. If I press hard, I get full opacity. Um, you could choose just a full opacity brush with no um, blending whatsoever if you want to, but I like to have just a little bit of imperfection around the outside because it's a bit more forgiving than trying to go for that perfect digital perfection. But I have seen as the working process for some artists, instead of painting this first step, um, we could either get this lasso tool, which relies on my hand-eye coordination, which I don't like very much, like that to get a nice silhouette, or I prefer the polygonal lasso tool whatever program you've got. Let me get rid of that. There we go. So I can do nice hard selections and then I just tap a few times to get curving shapes and probably clean them up by hand after fact. Um, get some nice clean edges. So I'm going to just do a demonstration of this. I don't really like this process. I prefer to do it by hand, but just as a demonstration. So I'm going to see the key is like getting these curves is, is pretty tough because this is a polygonal lasso tool. So at that point, I could just fill that space in and now deselect. And now you can see the places where there's imperfection. Let me turn off these other layers. You can see those little places where there's imperfection. 
but I could go back in and change my brush to an eraser and then clean it up a little bit. And to be fair, this did just speed up the process of making that quite a lot. And so it would be okay to do this even if you wanted to come back in and noodle it yourself by hand the entire time. But uh, I just prefer to do it fully with the brush tool instead. So if I just erase out part of this for an example, I'd prefer to come in and you know lay down brush strokes like this and like this and then come back with an eraser and clean up those transitioning edges and I need to rotate to get a nice hand angle which one you use is is entirely up to you it's just everybody else everybody finds a way to to be comfortable with the way that they work and how to do it quickly and both of those things are the priority. So here I would probably fill it in a little bit more like that, get my eraser back, clean that up, um, return back to normal. So now if I turn off those edges, I just like that this appears a little bit more natural compared to like the, the perfection of these polygonal lines over here. Um, it's just what I prefer and so it's up to you, but getting a full opacity silhouette on this object is the first priority. Uh, because it's going to allow us to paint a lot more comfortably. So I'm just going to work through the rest of that now. At this point, I was having a little bit of trouble uh, filling in these feathers without messing up some of the adjoining edges. So what I've decided to do, I'm just going to erase these down to before it makes any difference. Uh, add a new temporary layer and then do all of these feathers on that layer without interfering with the rest of this head. And then once I'm happy with it, combine it back down again, uh, which is just going to be a little bit easier for me to do. verifying that I filled in everything to my satisfaction like there's little imperfections like this and there might be one or two small spots where it's not fully opaque but in general we're just looking to get a nice reliable silhouette that we can paint on because we're always going to have the option after this process to add on top of this or erase away if we want to but that means that I can lock this layer and now I could switch to any color I want and paint and not worry about messing up the silhouette. Um, I forgot to mention, I didn't even think to mention really, that I just did all of this in bright red. And the reason I did it in bright red is because it's visible. Um, I could have chosen colors from my objects here, my object references if I wanted to, but I prefer to have a nice high contrast color to do this with, maybe even obnoxious. Sometimes I'll go with something like a lime green because it's very, very obvious if there's a hole in it. Um, but I chose something a little bit easier on the eyes for the sake of this video. Um, that allows me to see clearly whether or not I've made a mistake as early as possible. And uh, that way, uh, you know, head off any problems that might arise. So that's that, the first step. Uh, so now <clears throat> I'm gonna go through and separate this by subject and that might require a clipping mask or you might want to just copy paste this layer and erase away a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and add a group, clipping group, quick clipping group, right? And uh, I don't even really need to change these colors because this clipping group is going to ensure that um, whatever I paint up here is only going to stay in this region. So I can separate the different subjects within this object. So for instance, I've got this wrap, which is like leather. I've got the, I think it's cross guard, which is going to be brass. And I've got the head, which is also going to be brass. And I'm just going to separate those into three different layers so that it's easy to work with and paint. Uh, at this point, I will try to grab some kind of local color. So maybe like this brown, 
or I could come down to this much shinier one and get like this middle tone. Probably want something like this middle tone to start off with so I can choose how to um, shade it later. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna fill in the, all three of these separate areas and it may get broken down further into small bits like this bit of trim on the neck or individual wraps on the leather later on. Uh, but for now, this is gonna be the way that I'm gonna start off. Okay, so there's the object kind of blocked in. I realized that for the third part for the wrap, since it's already kind of shaped here, I could just use my original paint layer uh, and I blocked in the hilt and the head and now I've locked the transparency. So there's two effects going on. There's the clipping mask, which is happening here. And then there's also a transparency mask. So now if, for instance, I paint on the head and I grab some other, let's grab a very different color like this one and I paint here, not only will it not go outside of the bounds of my object, it won't go into the other regions of the object either because I've locked that transparency. So maybe all of these different setup steps are not necessary all the time, but they can speed you up a little bit when you know, you're trying to work very quickly. Okay? So the next thing I'm gonna do then is I wanna block in sort of my local uh, shadows and highlights or I want to block in my local colors more thoroughly if I have more than just this. In this case, it's a very kind of simple example where I've just got like a metal texture and I've got a, a very complex shape and the leather is not very complex in terms of local color either. And so either I could start blocking in my um, shapes of light and shadow or I could do texture and do light and shadow as a different layer on top of that. Um, with the way I'm working here, I think I'm just going to do my light and shadow shapes right on top. So this gets more into, can you imagine three-dimensional form? Uh, can you visualize where light would strike or where shadows would strike around this object? And if you can, then start blocking those things in. If you can't, then maybe fiddle with it. And you may even want to use an entirely different layer uh, in order to do this. but the way that I've set this up, it'd be easiest to just paint directly on this layer because it's already blocked off the way that I want. But it would be difficult to do that and also experiment because it's nice to be able to like erase back and forth. So let me recommend this if it's your first block in. Um, take the color that is local here, right? So sample this color and use that as your second color and then switch to your opposite color and then pick whatever your highlight color is gonna be. So we could take it directly from our reference. Um, and it's up to you if you wanna block in shadows or highlights. I think let's do shadows. I'm gonna grab like a darker portion of this image down here. So now if I paint with the shadow color, I get that. And if I switch, it ends up being like an eraser. So this can help you to, to work fairly comfortably as if you've got the ability to erase, just going back and forth between shadow and erasure, but as we add more and more details, we're gonna to have to start combining down and treating this just like a more traditional painting. Okay, uh, one thing I've seen frequently, which I think is a pretty interesting thing, uh, I'm actually gonna make outside of this group entirely, way up here, I'm just gonna drop these colors down that I've been using. Um, I like to do this because if I switch between programs, then I can just sample visually those colors that appear on the on the background. But uh, you could also use something like a, um, a palette set like this one over here in Photoshop has a similar one. Um, so something I like to do and I've seen frequently is that people will use a um, either a airbrush or a gradient tool to just put a general kind of um, shadow over the entire thing or highlight over the entire thing. So I'm gonna pick a lighter color and I've got a very big airbrush. Eventually, this thing is gonna be rotated down like this. So I have to imagine my light coming from some angle relevant to this down here. So it could come from the right-hand side above or the left-hand side above, or it could come from underneath. Uh, underneath is a dramatic kind of choice, which is kind of cool and it'll, it'll highlight this bladed edge. 
So I'll say, and let me go back to this one, get a different brush. I'll say that my light, mm, I might want to come up at the object like this and aim just a little bit um, at the front of the object, which would be kind of neat, which means that in my uh, little study up here, it's going to come kind of at this angle. Uh, it can be helpful to, to give yourself a little indicator like that. I'm doing this on another layer that I can hide later on. Uh, but I want to remind myself that the light is coming from this direction, so striking all of those surfaces there. And so on my objects, I'm going to get this airbrush. And I'm just doing this right on their, their background and just kind of fill in a very soft gradient across the object like that. This is not very specific, but it's a nice way to um, get this process started. And let me drop down my highlight color down here. There's my highlight color, my light. And for this grip, it looks like something kind of grayish like that. So on that portion, I'll do it as well. So kind of a nice way to get this process started. I, I didn't really do a very high contrast color there. Let me lighten that up fairly significantly. There we go. And it can serve as a reminder as well. Okay. So now, uh, in my head layer here, I'm going to go back to my soft brush, or my hard edge soft brush. There it is and uh, try to block in some shadow shapes. So I'm just imagining if the light is hitting these sides, what is the part that is going to get cast into shadow? So everything behind like these feathers is probably gonna go into shadow, which means that I'm gonna need to switch right back and forth like that. And since I've just applied my gradient, I probably should just do this on a completely different layer and, and erase after all. So one example of how you could work if you've got a solid color, just switching back and toward, forward between your colors. Another way that you could work is just on a completely new free layer. Um, it's still in this clipping group, by the way, which means that it won't go outside of the bounds, um, or sorry, I gotta click that A before that works. It won't go outside the bounds of the full silhouette, but it's not locked to the head anymore, right? So I'm gonna have to be careful down here, but it's still gonna be a pretty big convenience to be able to block in my shadows this way. So definitely behind all of these feathers, we'll get some shadows cast in that direction. We'll probably get deeper shadows the more it wraps around the form like that. And on the upper portions of objects that are not in the direct line of that light, so now I'm switching between eraser and brush, we'll get big blocked in shadowy areas like that forgot to hit that A, there we go. So this would be like on that forehead shape. Um, this cheek I imagine is sort of flaring outward, so it's probably gonna catch more light. So I won't block that part in. And wherever these feathers start to turn and then capture more light, we're gonna get a little bit of cast shadow from the previous shape on there. And then it will go to full brightness like that. So we might get just a little bit between these two feathers like this maybe like that and then this one's turning very very far so it might be either in full shadow or just barely catching a little highlight like this um, I'd recommend that for this first pass of your shadows not to worry about blending um, and softly transitioning your shadows just yet because uh, you could always do that as a, as a next step. And this is the simpler way to think about it. So every stage, what I'm trying to focus on is how can I make this easy on myself and not have to work uh, very, very hard to figure out what it is that I'm doing. And so doing things a little bit more simply, maybe even a little bit more crudely is a way to help out. So we'll just say that one's like probably entirely in shadow from this side over here. We'll have a pretty significant shadow shape. One's cast over here. Let's see. It's coming from this side, so I should probably have this side as being the, the shadow side. 
Let's do this. Like that, etc. So I'm going to work all around this and try to fill in a nice blocked in shadow area on this. So for this eye, I'm trying to figure out how the light might go across it because this is an engraving. It's a little bit tough to figure out. You can see here's the process I've got so far on um, lighting that head. And it's kind of complicated because I've got a lot of little bits and I, I did kind of want to challenge here to see if I could figure something this complex out. But uh, uh, the eye I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with because I know in my reference engraving, there was a certain shape to it, which I can't quite recall. I don't want something as simple as this little parrot eye down here. So this is a point where I should probably take a look at my reference again and refresh my memory as to what it was that was making the eye look like an eye in the engraving. So I've got a number of different references, as you know already. Um, some of them are going to be more specific, some are less. That one's not going to help at all uh, for this thing. But I have, I think, a better image of, what is it? this silver one to so the silver head if I can find it in my folder there it is so I can take a look actually it's it's much simpler than I thought there's a sort of um, thing that happens in statues sometimes where there's a eyeball with the iris as a cutout so to do a little drawing over here what you'll get is here's the um, the eyeball surface and then the iris part is just kind of cut and then scooped downward like this uh, inside of that. So this is not actually bulging out anymore. And this is sort of a dish. So if you've got your light shining on one side like that, this is all on layer 11, by the way, then this surface will be illuminated and this surface will be illuminated. So I think that's what I'm trying to simulate here is that the inner part of this dish would be, sim uh, would be illuminated and the near side of this would be darkened. So there we go. At least talking it out with myself, I can figure out, oh, that was neat. You see the red? Well, that's kind of cool, actually, with the base layer showing. It's almost like my light is red now, but never mind about that. So on this shadow layer, I'm going to try to make it look like that's what's happening um, by lighting the far side of this dish, but not the near side. And I guess that means that, in my case, the pupil would be standing outward instead of carved in because that's one more additional layer of this. So we'll see how that works. pretty good as a first pass there. Um, I think it's detailed enough that I can definitely see what I'm doing now. Not all of those details may be fully thought out or fully valid. Um, some of the things that I did in here, I probably should mention like this is a very complex surface. 
if you've got a complex surface like this and you're not already used to um, drawing with you know form and thinking about direction then try something simpler you know kind of like these ridges down here but at one point what I did was to um, I was looking at this complex section it was hard for me to figure out and then I thought well I'll just treat it like a big soft shape like this right so just chopped it up into this light side and dark side like that and then start to think in a little bit more detail. Let me turn that back on. So just redoing this one section while I talk about it. Um, so this side is the dark side, that side's the light side. Fill it all in. And then start to think about, okay, then based on the small shapes, where would the light actually extend a little bit farther than I thought? So on this brow ridge here, it's gonna be sticking out and down a little bit. So I probably want this to cut in like that a little bit. Right, which is gonna further define that section. And then we've got all these feathery shapes up here where it's like this feather has a turning side that would probably end up in shadow over here, but this side would be light, which means over on this one, I would get a little highlight here, probably. And over here, I'd probably see a little bit and pretty much on all the, the sides of these small feathers, facing towards my light source, I'll probably get a little highlight until we get to these very back ones where we won't get that anymore, but it can kind of help. And then the same way on the light side, I would get a little bit of shadow on this side of this feather and this one here, this one. And the closer I get to my uh, highlight side where all my light is coming from, the less and less of that I would get to the point where maybe this one wouldn't have any, or maybe it would have just a little tiny thin one or something like that. And then they would get thicker and darker and thicker and darker until finally we're over here where I've actually got to carve out the light side, not the dark side. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, but yeah, it can be it can be kind of complicated to figure out and a little bit um, bewildering, but just think about it carefully, work through it and try not to get overwhelmed by the task of doing that. Okay. So there you can see kind of a um, very brief mock-up of what I had. And so if I turn that one off and turn this other one back on, we can see it with a little bit more detail. Okay. So I'm going to do that process for these other two bits now. So I'll do it for this um, leather wrap and I'll do it for this part. Um, and then that should end this very first phase of painting where we've got our basic block in of our shapes and then our basic block in of light and shadow. All right, so that concludes the shadow block in for this stage of the painting, um, which is gonna be one of the more challenging stages, I would say, because you're establishing really how your light is going to move across your object. If you can really nail this stage and you can think three-dimensionally, then I'd say that's, that's one of the hardest parts of rendering a, a realistically three-dimensional object. Um, choosing simpler objects gives you the ability to work a little bit more quickly and easily. Choosing more complex objects gives you more practice, um, but you don't want to hamstring yourself and immediately attempt something really, really difficult right away. And now we have the benefit that I've done that in a layer that I can turn down the intensity of my shadows to give more environmental lighting all the way up to these don't exist at all or I could even blur these edges um, using other tools in a later stage, like let me just grab it real quick. Um, they've got this kind of Q-tip tool, which I think is kind of cool, um, where for soft edges like this cheek, this would probably want to be a soft transitional shape rather than a hard one. And so then we just soften out that edge and a lot of our work is done for us. I just went so far as to make it indistinct, so I'm going to go back. Um, if I make it just a little bit soft, then it's a harder edge, but not completely hard. And we can kind of just choose on a case by case basis how round we want each transitional surface to be, or just do it purely with paint. Um, in addition to that, because we're working digitally, I could duplicate this layer before doing that. 
duplicate layer, hide this copy, work on this one. So now I'm free to do whatever I want. I think I'll just do that sort of thing. And then if I turn this one back on, you know, there's my before and after. Or if I decide that I've completely messed up, then I could just dump this one and go back to my original one. So it's another nice way to work. So using um, digital tools for what they're good for and taking advantage of that can be really helpful. Okay? So in the next section, we'll continue our painting process by adding perhaps uh, highlights and then surface textures as well.